Chapter Thirteen, Part Two of the Scouts of Stonewall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Scouts of Stonewall by Joseph A. Altscheller. Chapter Thirteen, The Sullen Retreat, Part Two. Colonel Talbot procured another horse, and the Invincibles, sore of body and mind, resumed their slow and sullen retreat. Harry left them, and rode further along the front of the rear guard. Under the somber skies and in the dripping rain, there was a long line of flashing rifles and the flaming of big guns at intervals. Fremont was pushing the pursuit, and pushing it hard. Harry recognized anew the surpassing skill of Jackson, in keeping his enemies separated by mountains and streams while his own concentrated force marched on he felt that fremont would hold jackson in battle if he could until the other northern armies came up and he felt also that jackson would lead fremont beyond a junction with the others and then turn yet these northern men were certainly annoying they did not seem to mind defeats here they were fighting as hard as ever pursuing and not pursued. Harry, turning to the left, saw a numerous body of cavalry under Ashby, supported by guns also, and he joined them. Ashby, on his famous white horse, was riding here and there, exposing himself again and again to the fire of the enemy, who was pressing close. He nodded to Harry, whom he knew. You can report to General Jackson, he said, that the enemy is continually attacking, but that we are continually beating him off. Just as he spoke, a trumpet sounded loud and clear in the edge of a wood only three or four hundred yards away. There was a tremendous shout from many men, and then the thunder of hoofs. A cavalry detachment, more than a thousand strong, rushed down upon them, and to right and left of the horsemen, regiments of infantry, supported by field batteries, charged also. The movement was so sudden, so violent, and so well conceived, that Ashby's troops were swept away, despite every effort of the leader, who galloped back and forth on his white horse, begging them to stand. So powerful was the rush, that the cavalry were finally driven in retreat, and with them the Invincibles. Some of the troops, worn by battles and marches, until the will weakened with the body, broke and ran up the road. Harry heard behind him the triumphant shouts of their pursuers, and he saw the northern bayonets gleaming as they came on in masses. Ashby was imploring his men to stand, but they would not. The columns pressing upon them were too heavy, and they scarcely had strength enough left to fight. More and yet more troops came into battle. The northern success for the time was undoubted. The men in blue were driving in the southern rear guard, and Ashby was unable to hold the road. But the two colonels at last succeeded in drawing the Invincibles across the turnpike, where they knelt in good order and sent volley after volley into the pursuing ranks. Fremont's men wavered and then stopped, and Ashby, upbraiding his horsemen and calling their attention to the resolute stand of the infantry, brought them into action again. Infantry and cavalry, then uniting, drove back the northern vanguard, and for the time being the southern rear guard was safe once more. But the Invincibles and the cavalry were almost exhausted. Harry found St. Clair wounded, not badly, but with enough loss of blood for Colonel Talbot to send him to one of the wagons. He insisted that he was still fit to help hold the road, but Colonel Talbot ordered two of the soldiers to put him in the wagon, and he was compelled to submit. "'We can't let you die now from loss of blood, you young fire-eater,' said Colonel Talbot severely, "'because you may be able to serve us better by getting killed later on.' St. Clair smiled wanly, and with his formal South Carolina politeness said, "'Thanks, sir. It helps a lot when you're able to put it in such a satisfactory way.' Harry, who was unhurt, gave St. Clair a strong squeeze of the hand. "'You'll be up and with us again soon, Arthur,' he said consolingly, and then he rode away to Ashby. "'You may tell General Jackson that we can hold them back,' said the cavalry leader grimly. "'You have just seen for yourself.' "'I have, sir,' replied Harry, and he galloped away from the rear. But he soon met the general himself, drawn by the uncommonly heavy firing. 
Harry told him what had happened, but the expression of Jackson's face did not change. A rather severe encounter, he said, but Ashby can hold them. All that day, and nearly all that night, and all the following day, Harry passed between Jackson and Ashby, or with them. It was well for the Virginians that they were practically born on horseback, and were trained to open air and the forests. For thirty-six hours the cavalry were in the saddle, almost without a break. And so was Harry. He had forgotten all about food and rest. He was in a strange, excited mood. He seemed to see everything through a red mist. In all the thirty-six hours, the crash of rifles or the thud of cannon ceased scarcely for a moment. It went on just the same, in day or in night. The northern troops, although led by no such general as Stonewall Jackson, showed the splendid stuff of which they were made. They were always eager to push hard, and yet harder. The southern troops burnt the bridges over the creeks as they retreated. But the northern men waded through the water and followed. The clouds of cavalry were always in touch. A skirmish was invariably proceeding at some point. Towards evening of the second day's pursuit, they came to Mount Jackson, to which they had retreated once before, and there went into camp in a strong place. But the privates themselves knew that they could not stay there long. They might turn and beat off Remont's army, but then they would have to reckon with a second army under shields and the yet heavier masses that McDowell was bringing up. But Jackson himself gave no sign of discouragement. He went cheerfully among the men, and saw that attention, as far as possible at such a time, was given to their needs. Harry hunted up St. Clair, and found him with a bandaged shoulder, sitting in his wagon. He was sore but cheerful. The doctor tells me, Harry, that I can take my place in the line in three more days, he said, but I intend to make it two. I fancy that we need all the men we can get now, and that I won't be driven back to this wagon. If I were as well fixed as you are, Arthur, said Langdon, who appeared at this moment on the other side of the wagon, I'd stay where I was. But it's so long since I've been hauled that I'm afraid the luxury would overpower me. Think of lying on your back and letting the world float peacefully by. And did I say, think of it? I was wrong. It is unthinkable. Now, Harry... What plans has old Jack got for us? I don't know. Well, he'll get us out of this. We're sure of that. But when? That's the question. The question remained without an answer. Early the next morning, they were on the march again under lowering skies. The heavens from horizon to horizon were a sudden gray and began to drip rain. Harry was sent again to the rear guard, where Ashby's cavalry hung like a curtain, backed by the Invincibles and one or two other skeleton regiments. Harry joined Sherborne, and now the drip of the rain became a steady beat. Chilling winds from the mountains swept over them. He had preserved through thick and thin, through battle and through march, that big cavalry cloak, and now he buttoned it tightly around him. He saw down the road puffs of smoke and heard the lashing fire of rifles, but it did not make his pulses beat any faster now. He had grown so used to it that it seemed to be his normal life. A bullet, fired from a rifle of longer range than the others, plumped into the mud at the feet of his horse, but he paid no attention to it. He joined Sherborne, who was using his glasses, watching through the heavy thick air the northern advance. The brilliant young cavalryman, while as bold and enduring as ever, had changed greatly in the last two or three weeks. The fine uniform was stained and bedraggled. Sherborne himself had lost more than twenty pounds, and his face was lined and anxious, far more than the face of a mere boy of twenty-three should have been. "'I think they'll press harder than ever,' said Sherborne. "'Why? The Shenandoah River, or rather the North Fork of it, isn't far ahead.' They'd like to coop us up against it and make us fight, while their army under shields and all their other armies, God knows how many they have, are coming up. The river is bridged, isn't it? Yes, but it takes a good while to get an army such as ours, loaded down with prisoners and spoil across it. And if they rushed us, just when we were starting over it, we'd have to turn and give battle. Jupiter, how it rains! Behold the beauties of war, Harry. The wind suddenly veered a little and with it the rain came hard and fast. It seemed to blow off the mountains in sheets, and for a moment or two Harry was blinded. 
The beat of the storm upon leaves and earth was so hard that the cracking of the rifles was dulled and deadened. Nevertheless, the rifle fire went on, and as well as Harry could judge, without any decrease in violence. Hear the bugles now, said Sherborne. Their scouts are warning them of the approach to the Shenandoah. They'll be coming up in a minute or two in heavier force. Ah, see, Ashby understands, too. He's massing the men to hold them back. The rain still poured with all the violence of a deluge, but the northern force, horse and cannon, pushed forward through the mud and opened with all their might. Ashby's cavalry and the infantry in support replied. There was something grim and awful to Harry in this fight in the raging storm. Now and then he could not see the flame of the firing for the rain in his eyes. By a singular chance, a bullet cut the button of his cloak at the throat, and the cloak flew open there. In a minute he was soaked through and through with water, but he did not notice it. The cavalry, the Invincibles, and the other regiments were making a desperate stand in order that the army might cross the bridge of the Shenandoah. Harry was seized with a sort of fury. Why should these men try to keep them from getting across? It was their right to escape. Presently he found himself firing with his pistols into the great pillar of fire and smoke and rain in front of him. Mud splashed up by the horses struck him in the face now and then and stung like gunpowder But he began to shout with joy when he saw that Ashby was holding back the northern vanguard Ahead of him the southern army was already rumbling over the bridge while the swollen and unfordable waters of the Shenandoah raced beneath it But the northern brigades pressed hard and Harry did not know whether the rain helped them or hurt them But at any rate it was terribly uncomfortable it poured on them in sheets and sheets, and the earth seemed to be a huge quagmire. He wondered how the men were able to keep their ammunition dry enough to fire, but that they did was evident from the crash that went on without ceasing. In thinking of war before I really knew it, said Harry, I never thought much of weather. Does sound commonplace, but it cuts a mighty big figure, I can tell you. If it hadn't rained so hard just before Waterloo, Napoleon would have got up his big guns more easily, winning the battle and perhaps changing the history of the world. Confound it, look at that crowd pushing forward through the field to take us in the flank. Western men, I think, said Harry. Here are two of our field guns. Sherborne, get him to throw some grape in there. It was lucky that the guns approached at that moment. Their commander, as quick of eye as either Harry or Sherborne, unlimbered and swept back the Western men who were seeking to turn their flank. Then Sherborne, with a charge of his cavalry, sent them back further. But at the call of Ashby's trumpet, they turned quickly and galloped after Jackson's army, the main part of which had now passed the bridge. I suppose we'll burn the bridge after we cross it, said Harry. Of course. But how on earth can we set fire to it with this Noah's flood coming down? I don't know, but they'll manage it somehow. Look, Harry. See the flames bursting from the timbers now? Gallop, men, gallop! We may get our faces scorched in crossing the bridge, but when we're on the other side, it won't be there for the Yankees. The Invincibles and the other infantry regiments all were advancing at the double quick, with the cavalry closing up the rear. Behind them many bugles rang, and through the dense rain they saw the northern cavalry leaders swinging their sabers and cheering on their men, and they also saw behind them the heavy masses of infantry coming up. Harry knew that it was touch and go. The bulk of the army was across, and if necessary, they must sacrifice Ashby's cavalry, but that sacrifice would be too great. Harry had never seen Ashby and his gallant captains show more courage. They fought off the enemy to the very last, and then galloped for the bridge, under a shower of shell and grape and bullets. Ashby's own horse was killed under him, falling headlong in the mud, but in an instant somebody supplied him with a fresh one upon which he leaped and then they thundered over the burning bridge, Ashby and Sherborne, the last two to begin the crossing. Harry, who was just ahead of Ashby and Sherborne, felt as if the flames were licking at them. With an involuntary motion, he threw up his hands to protect his eyes from the heat, and he also had a horrible sensation, lest the bridge, its supporting timbers burned through, should fall, sending them all into the rushing flood. But the bridge yet held, and Harry uttered a gasp of relief as the feet of his horse struck the deep mud on the other side. They galloped on for two or three hundred yards, and then, at the command of Ashby, turned. The bridge was a majestic sight. 
a roaring pyramid that shot forth clouds of smoke and sparks in myriads. How under the sun did we cross it? Harry exclaimed. We crossed it. That's sure because we're here, said Sherborne. I confess myself that I don't know just how we did it, Harry, but it's quite certain that the enemy will never cross it. The fire's too strong. Besides, they'd have our men to face. Harry looked about and saw several thousand men drawn up to dispute the passage. But the northern troops, recognizing its impossibility at that time, made no attempt. Nevertheless, their cannon sent shells curving over the stream, and the southern cannon sent curving shells in reply. But the burning bridge roared louder, and the pyramid of flame rose higher. The rain, which had never ceased to pour in a deluge, merely seemed to feed it. Ah! She's about to go now, exclaimed Sherborne. The bridge seemed to Harry to rear up before his eyes like a living thing, and then draw together a mass of burning timbers. The next moment the whole went with a mighty crash into the river, and the blazing fragments floated swiftly away on the flood. The deep and rapid Shenandoah flowed a barrier between the armies of Jackson and Fremont. A river can be very beautiful without a bridge, Harry, can't it? said a voice beside him. It was St. Clair, a heavy bandage over his left shoulder, but a smoking rifle in his right hand nevertheless. I couldn't stand it any longer, Harry, he said. I had to get up and join the Invincibles, and you see, I'm all right. Harry was compelled to laugh at the sodden figure from which the rain ran in streams, but he admired St. Clair's spirit. It was by a hair's breadth, Arthur, he said. But we won across just the same, and now I'm going back to that wagon to finish my cure. I fancy that we'll now have a rest of six or eight hours, if General Jackson doesn't think so much time taken from a war a mere frivolity. The southern army drew off slowly, but as soon as it was out of sight, the tenacious northern troops undertook to follow. They attempted to build a bridge of boats, but the flood was so heavy that they were swept away. Then Fremont set men to work to rebuild the bridge, which they could do in twenty-four hours. But Jackson, meanwhile, was using every one of those precious hours. End of chapter 13, part 2